It's wonderful to see so many students and faculty and staff and members of our community here today for our annual Lang Lecture. The Lang Lecture was established to honor Professor David Lang, who retired from Duke Law School in 2015 as the Melvin G. Shim Emeritus Professor of Law after 44 years on our faculty. A beloved teacher and renowned scholar, Professor Lang specializes in intellectual property, copyright, trademarks, unfair competition, and entertainment law. He's particularly well known for his transformative work on the public domain, and is also the co-author of a case book on intellectual property that is now in its fifth edition, as well as a book entitled No Law, Intellectual Property in the Image of an Absolute First Amendment, which he wrote with his fellow Duke Law professor, Jeff Powell, who's here today. Prior to Professor Lang's retirement, this endowed lecture was known as the Kip and Meredith Fry Lecture. In recognition of his career and contributions, the Fry's renamed it in Professor Lang's honor following his retirement. Professor Lang is here today, so please join me in recognizing him and his many <clears throat> accomplishments. It is now my great honor and pleasure to recognize this year's Lang lecturer, Mark Lemley. Professor Lemley is the William H. Newcomb Professor of Law at Stanford Law School and the director of the Stanford Program in Law, Science, and Technology. <coughs> at Stanford, he teaches intellectual property, patent law, trademark law, remedies, antitrust, the law of robotics and AI, and video game law. Professor Lemley is unusual in that he is both a world-renowned legal scholar and a leading intellectual property lawyer. We could be here all day if I listed all of his accomplishments, so let me give you a few highlights. As a scholar, Professor Lemley is the author of eight books and I think 175 articles. It changes by day, so it's hard to get a, a current number. His work has been cited over 270 times by courts, including 15 times by the United States Supreme Court, uh, which makes him one of the five most cited legal scholars of all time in any field, not just in intellectual property. As a lawyer, Professor <coughs> Lemley has argued 27 federal appellate cases, which indeed is a, another number which may have changed since I last checked, countless federal district and state cases, and has participated either as counsel or amici in more than three dozen Supreme Court cases. He is also the founder of Lex Machina, a startup company that was acquired by Lexis in 2015 that provides data analytics, litigation data and analytics. When Professor Lemley and I spoke about his visit to Duke to deliver this lecture, he warned me that the project he'd like to share with us is broader than simply intellectual property law. Instead, his topic is the balkanization of the internet. I hope you'll agree with me that we are lucky to hear one of the world's leading scholars of intellectual property and technology law share with us his current thinking on a topic that is critically important to our time. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Lemley. <clears throat> Thank you, Dean Abrams, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, John Perry Barlow, who was uh, honored with a, a symposium here at Duke uh, just last year, uh, famously wrote in 1996 what he called the Cyberspace Declaration of Independence. Governments of the industrial world, he wrote, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. John Gilmore, uh, another famous internet pioneer in 1993, uh, coined the famous aphorism, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. Now that was a long time ago. Uh, it was so long ago, in fact, you can tell it was a long time ago because we hadn't settled on what we were actually going to call the internet. Right? Maybe it was cyberspace, maybe it was the net. Uh, Infobon was floating around there at the time. Um, and these sentiments, I think, sound somewhat quaint by modern standards. Uh, but it's worth remembering or learning um, right, that the internet of that day was the underground pirate alternative to where everybody thought uh, that information technology was going. Uh, the corporate and government big boys uh, had a plan uh, we're going to build broadband uh, uh, wires uh, for an information superhighway. Uh, 
And the information superhighway was going to deliver prepackaged content to you in a one-way pipe with 500 channels of television. Uh, and that was going to be our uh, uh, technology connection, right? Because the idea that we might actually want to share information ourselves rather than merely passively consume it right, hadn't made it into the consciousness of the people who were around building the, the technology. The internet, by contrast, what sort of supplanted the information superhighway, started as, as a niche government academic project to allow academics and military folks to communicate together. Uh, indeed, it wasn't until 1986 that commercial entities were even allowed on, and then only if they had some connection uh, to, to DARPA and the research agencies. It wasn't until 1992 uh, that they actually had unrestricted access. What became the private internet started as a series of walled gardens. A bunch of people who wanted to get together uh, in uh, small communities like the Whole Earth Electronic Link, the Well, uh, or AOL, Prodigy, and CompuServe. Uh, and what the internet did was something quite remarkable. Uh, it allowed people to connect outside those walled gardens. It allowed you to uh, interact with someone uh, who wasn't part of a pre-existing community, who wasn't geographically near you, who wasn't in the same community of scholarship, in the same community of thought with you. Uh, and that connection turned out to be extraordinarily and unexpectedly valuable. My thesis today is that the internet is being balkanized, that we are returning to walled gardens, uh, that those walled gardens are both a function of private companies, but increasingly uh, they are uh, being created by drawing national boundaries uh, around the internet. Uh, I think this phenomenon is already far along and there are powerful forces behind it. I also think that the balkanization of the internet is a bad thing uh, and that we should stop it if we can. Now, but I'm gonna pause here um, uh, and note uh, that there should be a fairly heavy presumption against my argument uh, because I am not the first person to say that the internet uh, is in trouble and is going to die. And this is not even the first time I've said the internet is in trouble and is going to die. The internet has shown surprising resilience uh, and so we shouldn't just assume it's going to go away. Nonetheless, I hope to convince you in the next 30 or 40 minutes uh, that there is a real problem here uh, and that we should be concerned about it. And one way to think about that problem is to take John Gilmore's aphorism and reverse it. John Gilmore says in 1993, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. We have this distributed network that can avoid government centralized control. Today, I think it's fairer to say that censorship interprets the internet as damage and routes around it that the government has in fact figured out uh, ways to avoid or control uh, efforts of the internet to get around its censorship. So let me start by trying to persuade you that we are dividing uh, the internet as we speak. Now, how can I say that we're balkanizing the internet? If you look around, right, by all accounts, it's the giants of technology who increasingly run everything. Right? Uh, Google and Facebook and Apple are everywhere in our world. That sure seems like centralization, right? not uh, decentralization. Well, the first thing to note is that that's true for most of you because you're in the United States. If you look outside the United States, though, things look very different. So we worry in the United States about decades dominant platforms, and I'm going to talk about those platforms in a bit. But those platforms aren't actually dominant in most of the world. If you go to China, right, uh, you will not find Google uh, and Facebook at all, and you will not find Apple as a dominant player. Uh, the companies that dominate the Chinese internet ecosystem are WeChat and Baidu and Tencent. If you go to Russia, uh, you'll find Yandex, right, and not Google as the, as the dominant company. Uh, and I think increasingly this is going to turn out to be true in Europe. Europe is a bit of a special case, and we'll talk more about it. Uh, but Europe is targeting and restricting US companies on the internet for both policy and mercantilist regions. Uh, and I think that they will end up driving either separate European internet uh, companies and internet technologies, or perhaps co-opting US companies in ways uh, that still end up dividing the US experience from the European experience. 
And then if you look at the rest of the world, what you see is actually an ongoing nation by nation competition for who gets the internet. Um, and that competition is not one that the US is necessarily gonna win. Right? To date, uh, company, countries like Brazil and India have been primarily adopting US technology companies and US technology platforms, though there's reason to think that's about to change. But if you look at Vietnam and Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, right, those are companies that are buying into the Chinese model. Uh, and the companies that end up kind of running the internet in those countries will increasingly be the Baidu's and WeChat's of the world, not the Google's and Facebook's of the world. That's also true, I think, in many countries in Africa and even Latin America, where China is building the physical infrastructure, and it's increasingly easy for them uh, to also build the software and technological infrastructure. So, uh, we are, I th we, whether or not we have a, a dominant player, many countries have dominant private players in, in the internet, but they're not the same private player. That's not just competition for what company runs large aspects of your life. Uh, it's instead, I think, a reflective of competition about regulatory models that are gonna determine whether the internet as we know it will continue to exist in any given country. Right? So in the United States, we largely listened to Barlow, at least in the 1990s, and at least where the sacred cow of intellectual property wasn't at issue. Right? We let the technology companies get largely free reign, they end up controlling your data, and that's a potential problem for many people, but by and large, people have been free to post what they want, and they've been free to sort of share it on whatever platform they want. I think there's reason to think that's gonna change in the current political climate. The US internet is under a lot of pressure uh, from a variety of sources. But if it does change, it's, likely, it's, it's as likely to be in the direction of less private filtering of content more First Amendment protection for hate speech as the reverse. Uh, so the freedom uh, uh, with its good and bad aspects of the US internet, I think uh, is, is and will remain the US model. Um, IP is a big exception. US copyright industries uh, would like to shut down as much of the internet as possible. I think they've given up trying to shut it down to altogether, but they would like to lock it down to the extent possible. Um, one way they accomplish that is through geoblocking, uh, and increasingly they are being accommodated by US tech companies who are coming to deals with the uh, copyright uh, uh, companies uh, to uh, engage in various kinds of filtering. In Europe, by contrast, the content industries and the government get more and more effective control over the internet than they do in the United States. IP is once again a big driver here. Uh, the copyright industries in Europe are quite strong and the political leverage that US tech companies have at least until recently had uh, in the United States is not present in, um, uh, in Europe. There's also I think a kind of nationalistic bias or Europe-centric bias against US tech companies um, uh, and there's a, a much greater concern with privacy in Europe than there has been historically in the United States. Uh, and all of that is meant that the EU is increasingly uh, seeking and increasingly getting control over uh, what goes out on the internet. Uh, they use that control primarily for commercial or mercantilist ends. Uh, uh, we want our newspapers to be paid more. Uh, we want uh, uh, control over copyright law. Uh, sometimes they use it for privacy for both good and bad purposes, right? Uh, I want uh, the companies not to collect information about me, uh, but I also want to be able to hide bad public facts about me uh, so that people can't find out bad things that I've done in the past. Europe's also more likely the, than the United States to control uh, various kinds of hate speech, uh, whether it's kind of Nazi uh, memorabilia or other information that they find offensive. But by and large, Europe doesn't look radically different than the United States. Uh, in China and Russia, by contrast, the internet is effectively controlled by the political arm of the state. Uh, and that state is both surveilling and locking down speech they don't like. Uh, you can't talk about democracy or Falun Gong or Tiananmen Square or more recently Hong Kong elections uh, on WeChat uh, or you'll just get shut down. Right? That works because China has uh, built a set of censorship systems uh, that work with the Chinese 
uh, apps and software uh, that almost everyone uses in those countries. India is an interesting example, I think, of a, of a, a country that has traditionally had a relatively open internet, uh, but which seems to be moving very heavily in the direction of locking it down. Uh, they shut down the internet altogether in Kashmir for several months as part of a, a political attack and crackdown on the Muslim population there. Uh, and that model, I think, is increasingly likely to be used in India. It's also increasingly likely to be used by authoritarian regimes around the world, or authoritarian wannabes. Uh, right? These countries learned from Arab Spring the power of technology in potentially fomenting a revolution. And if you're an authoritarian government, you don't want a revolution. Uh, so we need to be able to control, to lock down the means of communication. Uh, and we've learned from various other examples, from China, from Russia, from India, uh, that we can shut down either individual companies uh, blocking Facebook until they take down posts we don't like, for instance, uh, blocking Google until they do various things, or even blocking the internet altogether to prevent dissidents from organizing. And Iran, Turkey, Malaysia, uh, Brazil, and various other Arab countries have all um, uh, done this at one form or another. And Brazil, interestingly, uh, has announced its intention to create a national walled off internet on the China model most explicitly doing the sort of thing that I'm talking about here. Now, it's not just local regulations, differences in kind of governmental approaches that are leading to different software in different countries. Rather, I think it's increasingly hard for foreign internet programs or applications to penetrate local markets as a structural matter. Uh, Russia, for instance, has blocked LinkedIn uh, is requiring local Russian apps to be loaded on all smartphones uh, and is indeed writing its own Wikipedia. Right? Uh, it doesn't like the fact that, hey, just anybody could come and give information to the world. Right? We want our citizens to see our government vetted and approved information. China, I think, hasn't written its own Wikipedia, but it has effectively achieved much the same result by banning Facebook and Google unless they complied with local censorship laws, which kept those, them out of the country, right? and uh, encouraging the development of alternatives right, like Baidu and Tencent, which are, because they are local, because they are Chinese, ultimately beholden to the Chinese government. It's not just China and Russia, though. Um, uh, how many people here have used the TikTok app? Fewer than I would have thought. Um, people younger than you are using the TikTok app. <laughs> but you may not be using it for long. Because the US is on an active campaign to shut down TikTok, because TikTok uh, is owned by a Chinese parent company. And if it's owned by a Chinese parent company, the US government fears they must secretly be spying on us. Now, I don't know whether they are, in fact, secretly spying on us. I'm not sure that if you actually saw everything Americans were doing on TikTok that you would gain much of great social value. Um, but, but the worry, I think, the, the point I think is that this is not merely a, hey, authoritarian governments are using this to lock down the internet. Right? The US is responding in a number of cases by saying, we don't want foreign apps on our soil, right? making it harder for them to, to act. Europe, as I mentioned, is in an interesting middle position because it doesn't have its own software companies for the most part, uh, in part because of its uh, less uh, uh, permissive attitude towards the early days of the internet and development. Most of the technology companies that developed, developed in the United States. But it's the largest market in the world. Uh, and as the US increasingly abandons any pretense of global leadership, right, it increasingly controls the way US companies work either by setting a standard that others follow, uh, passing something like the GDPR on privacy, which then gets copied in California in their uh, uh, Privacy Act, by insisting on imposing its rules worldwide. Uh, our GDPR rules apply not to European citizens, not to transactions in Europe, but to any company that does any business uh, with folks in Europe, which is almost any company. Um, uh, and... Uh, or by prompting balkanization more explicitly within a company, right? By driving geolocation or geoblocking and saying, we don't care what your uh, US uh, uh, consumers experience, here's what everyone in Europe has to see. Anu Bradford has gone so far as to say the EU rules the world at this point. Um, 
not because it is the most powerful, although it, it does currently have the largest economy. Uh, it was about to get smaller with Brexit. Um, uh, but because it has the regulatory will to use that economic power to try to tell other people what they have to do, at least in Europe. And that increasingly then uh, gets adopted by companies as a practical matter as what they do in the rest of the world. So not only, I think, do people go to different software and go to different experiences in different countries, the same software is customized for location. Right? Uh, and what that means increasingly is that the promise of the internet, we get, to, we get to communicate with people, we get to share information and experiences with people all around the world, um, uh, is being cut short. The news you see, the facts you see, uh, the, even the maps you see, change depending on where you are whether because they're being produced by different country, companies, whether because they're required by different countries to do it, or whether by the same global uh, company giving different information to different people because the governments demand it. But it's not just software. Increasingly, hardware is itself being nationalized. Now, some of this is market division. Uh, the iPhone is the dominant uh, device in the United States. Uh, and in the sort of most of the rich Commonwealth countries, US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. iPhone is the dominant phone. Those are the only countries in which the iPhone is the dominant phone. In the rest of the world, uh, some phone from the Android ecosystem uh, is the dominant phone, and, I, and iPhone shares are actually quite small. Indeed, uh, it has less than a third of the overall uh, uh, market. So, that could be consumer choice, right? iPhones cost more than uh, a lot of Android phones, so maybe they're more likely to be purchased in rich countries. Uh, but that's not all of it. Uh, with the exception of Norway, nowhere in Europe is the iPhone dominant. Um, but it's going to become an increasingly significant problem. The US is currently uh, in the process of banning Chinese phones from the market. Huawei and ZTE phones uh, are viewed as a security risk, uh, much like TikTok. Right? We want to try to keep them out of the US market altogether. We are pushing Europe, so far unsuccessfully, to do the same, uh, to say, don't buy any Chinese phones. Uh, the US has even objected uh, to uh, the presence of Huawei router equipment on private land sufficiently near a US military base in a foreign country. Right? So we, also, we not only don't want Huawei phones or technology in the United States uh, or on US military bases, we don't want them within a certain range, uh, a, a geographic range around a US military base. As part of this policy, the US is affirmatively engaged in a kind of mercantilist battle to try to promote Qualcomm and Qualcomm's chips over alternatives. Uh, the US government filed a brief challenging the Federal Trade Commission, a different uh, uh, branch of the US government, saying we have to let Qualcomm hold on to a monopoly on chips, even though they're violating the antitrust laws, because to do otherwise would violate national security. If we let anybody but Qualcomm build the chips, who knows what's going to be in those chips. They could have spyware, they could have bad stuff, uh, they won't be US companies. Um, US refused to allow Broadcom to buy Qualcomm uh, because Broadcom's CEO is based in Singapore. Uh, and the US said, well, wait a minute, right now we'd have ultimate control over the chip company because they're based in the United States. If they're based in Singapore, who knows what could happen, right? The Singaporean government could impose restrictions or requirements on what, uh, what this chip company does or, conversely, the US would be less able to impose those requirements. So this isn't something that's going to go unanswered. Uh, if you say to China, sorry, none of your companies can participate in uh, uh, building uh, uh, phones for the next generation, if you say to Singapore, sorry, none of your country companies can participate in building chips to go in those phones, uh, we'll see similar responses. China is building a 5G network, and it's not just building it in China. Through the Belt and Road Initiative, it's building it in Africa and Latin America and Asia as well. And that 5G network may well 
uh, reflect uh, incompatible standards with the US 5G network because we are going to build different hardware systems that don't talk to each other. This is something we used to have in the early days of, of cell phones, uh, GSM versus CDMA technologies. It's something we used to have in the early days of software. Uh, you couldn't actually read files from an Apple if you were on a, a Windows computer and vice versa. But it's something we've gotten away from and, and I think to, uh, to everyone's benefit. We, we, it looks like we're moving back there. Now, some of this is justified by worries about foreign spying, um, but I think it's at least as much justified, both in the US and in China, by a desire for domestic spying. Right? Um, the, I, so it, it's worth remembering that the US right, it has a pretty comprehensive surveillance infrastructure in place. Anybody remember Ed Snowden? Uh, right? the, the world has kind of, there have been sufficient shocks in the world that we kind of forgot about that one, but um, uh, it's, it is the case, right, that we have built and are trying to maintain quite a significant electronic surveillance mechanism. Uh, the FBI uh, has on several occasions, including most recently this month, uh, tried to prevent private companies within the United States from engaging in effective encryption. They've tried to block Facebook from doing end-to-end -end encryption on WhatsApp. Uh, they have uh, tried to force Apple to put a back door into their phone so that when something bad happens, the FBI has the ability to unlock that phone. That's a battle that has been going on for a long time. Uh, the few people in the room as old as me might remember the clipper chip uh, of 1995, which was the last time the US government said, we need to build a back door in the internet so that the FBI can see and read everything you're doing. Um, uh, it was unsuccessful, at least as a hardware technology, though it might have uh, worked at the NSA. So, I mean, I think at most what we could say is, right, his, the historically per pervasive US communications software surveillance is used in the service of a less repressive agenda here than it is elsewhere. I hope that will remain true, um, uh, but I'm not sure that it will. And at a minimum, even if you still trust your government to always do the right thing, the rest of the world doesn't. Uh, and that means that if we're going to insist on US chips with US surveillance built in, and China's going to insist on Chinese chips with Chinese surveillance built in, uh, companies are not, and countries are not automatically going to choose the US uh, as the lesser of two evils. The software differences, I think, are bad enough. But once internet hardware is country specific, this becomes harder and harder to undo. And if devices are built by national network, uh, Chinese phones work with Chinese software apps in China, US phones work with US software apps in the US, it becomes, it's easier, it's more logical to optimize the software for the, that hardware, to run uh, incompatible software because it works well with all the other folks I'm communicating with most of the time, where we're in my country. Um, so we're not just experiencing different things on the same network. Increasingly, our devices may not be capable of interoperating or even seeing the same things. And even the backbone of the internet itself is not immune from nationalization. So the internet has always been international and global. In part, though, that's just kind of a weird accident. The US was the de facto custodian of the internet because the companies that administered the backbone happened to be located here because it was first built here, and we have traditionally been the laissez-faire country when it comes to the internet. Um, but that effective freedom is changing. There are increasing moves by companies and internet service providers to filter malicious sites uh, at the DNS level so that they are never accessible all, at all even on your server system. Not just that you don't see them on your device, your corporate server never sees them. We pretend that that site on the internet simply doesn't exist. If you, if you try to send a message to it, you will not get a response. And of course, malicious sites depends on your perspective. It could be, and often is, cybersecurity, hacking, uh, phishing scams, and the like, but it could also be porn, right? Or democracy in Hong Kong uh, that's viewed as a malicious site depending on who's deciding which parts of the internet you get to see. Other ISPs insert their own advertising for non-existent pages, so if I try to search for a page and it doesn't show up, uh, the ISP sort of pretends there's a page there and gives it advertising. And of course, hackers uh, try to attack the, the internet routing system altogether, substituting a malicious page for the one the system expects to find. In any event, the DNS system is not officially a US phenomenon. 
Uh, and even unofficially, its control, uh, de facto control by the U.S. is shrinking. Uh, we passed uh, control from the U.S. government to a private uh, nonprofit organization called ICANN a couple of decades ago. ICANN is a sort of dubious custodian of the uh, domain name system. Their, their current project is to sell .org, uh, the nonprofit uh, top-level domain for a billion dollars to, to for-profit companies who will presumably then not do anything profit-making with it, but it seems unlikely. Um, but even if you thought ICANN was fine, and ICANN is based in the United States, so is nominally subject to US law, uh, many countries are pushing to take control of the backbone away from the US altogether, putting it in the hands of the, of, of the, of the United Nations through the ITU, or practically more likely, giving each country control of its own top level domain. So that UK governments uh, would actually have control over the parts of the DNS server that point to uh, .uk and, and the like. And if you do that, that makes political shutdowns or diversions a lot easier. And indeed, various countries, including unfortunately the United States, have made efforts to interfere with the DNS routing for political purposes. Uh, internet shutdowns in Iran and Turkey uh, were done by basically rerouting or, con uh, or, or turning off um, uh, access to the outside world. Um, in the United States, uh, nearly a decade ago, uh, we proposed legislation called SOPA and PIPA that would have enforced US copyright law by literally making the sites that infringe invisible to the world. The DNS servers simply would not return a result, and any internet service provider would be forced to pretend to you that those things didn't exist. Right? Not tell you they're infringing, not take down the sites, but pretend that they did not exist at all. SOPA and PIPA died because an unprecedented number of internet users rose up against it en masse to protect the internet. But I'm not sure that people have the same love for the internet in 2020 that they did in 2011. Uh, and it's worth remembering that even the very backbone of the internet, this, this DNS routing system, is fragile. Right? The DNS system that makes it work is literally controlled by 14 people who hold seven sets of keys. And they have to agree on, yes, this is a canonical router. Uh, they're sort of the early uh, blockchain, I guess, is the, is, is the way to think about it. right? We, right if, we, if we all agree, this must be a canonical router. If you can change that, if the com those computers change their DNS entry, or even if they start to disagree, we no longer see the same things on the internet. Not that they're blocked. Right? It's someone with control over a DNS server can literally create their own version of the internet that everyone who relies on that server will assume is the canonical one. So I think we're losing the internet. We're replacing it with the splinternet, a balkanized set of computer protocols that increasingly differs by company and by country. That's not a good thing. Now, you might not like some aspects of the internet. Some aspects of the internet are pretty horrible. Um, and different countries may want different things from it. They might, may want to regulate it in different ways. They may want it to do different th ways, things. But it's improved the world in all kinds of ways. Some of those are economic. Uh, estimates that worldwide data flow over the internet is now 10% of global GDP. 10% right? of all the money in the world is basically uh, uh, attributable to internet traffic. Some of them are lifestyle. Right? Our phone improves our lives in ways we don't think about. Right? Because we're not lost in a foreign country where we don't speak the language. Right? We have a map that will get us where we want to go. We're not stuck on the highway with a flat tire and no way to communicate to anyone about that fact. Uh, we're not sitting in a restaurant waiting for a friend who canceled. Right? Or debating some arcane fact with our friends without a device in our pocket capable of accessing all of the world's information. Um, those are, you know, it, for most of my lifetime, you did not take those things for granted. Right? Uh, these are things that became available right, because we have access to this uh, intersecting uh, universe of information. And most of those benefits involve connection and the ability for systems to work together across multiple countries, across multiple languages. And that's why the internet and not Prodigy or CompuServe is the thing we use today. Balkanization means it's harder for people to share experiences across countries. Uh, Paul Ohm, uh, Jack Goldsmith have said, you know what, that's OK. Because we want different countries to have different rules, uh, and they should be able to regulate the internet just as they should be able to regulate any other part of their, of their world. But I think we lose something real when we do that. It takes away the ability to see what the rest of the world has, how the rest of the world thinks, and that's a loss. 
I think it's a loss for us, but it's a real loss for people in repressive regimes who can look to the outside world for hope, for inspiration to demand change, for the means of facilitating that change. If we take that away, uh, we take away freedom for a substantial number of people. It also means it's easier for repressive governments to shut down outside access altogether, as Iran has, as India has in Kashmir, to prevent a rise, uh, a rise or a reprise of Arab Spring, as Turkey has done. And even if they don't shut down the internet altogether, right, those countries get much more significant control over the companies who are providing the information to you because those companies are local. Google can tell China to pound sand, and it did. Medium can tell Malaysia to pound sand, and it did when they were told to censor content that they didn't like. Baidu can't do the same with China, because Baidu is China. Furthermore, nationalized surveillance-enabled systems aren't just enabling government repression, they're also a cybersecurity nightmare. Right? Collect all of the sensitive data about what people are saying, what they're doing, what their accounts look like in a government system, and that government system will be hacked. Right? I guarantee it. The more valuable the data they collect, the bigger the targets they are. And we've built not just our political and our uh, social uh, polity and conversation into the internet, we've built many of our most important systems around the internet bank backbone. Right? Your banks, uh, your power companies, right? various things that we depend on for the infrastructure of modern civilization right? are built into a network which we are increasingly making a national, hackable, surveilled system. Um, and the idea that governments, foreign governments or US government, will have more control over them is, is troubling. The worst thing to me, I think, is uh, that I think the way we're losing the internet parallels the way we're losing the project of globalization, uh, which for me is something valuable. Uh, we're replacing it with a particularly authoritarian form of tribalism. Right? Uh, in, uh, in countries around the world, in the US, in the UK, in China, Russia, India, Brazil, Turkey, Hungary, the Philippines, right, name country after country, uh, right, where um, uh, the, the future seems to be not reaching out uh, and interacting with the world around you, but autarkies, right, uh, 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 kind of uh, boundary creation around your race, around your uh, national, nationality, and so forth. So one of the places you might want to turn uh, to try to do something about this, uh, which is sort of international law and international norms, it's not obvious uh, how effective that's going to be. So that brings me to the last part of the speech, the part of the speech where I tell you how to solve the problem. Unfortunately, I don't have great ideas, I got to tell you. I have a few tentative thoughts which I will give you, but I do not have a solution for what I see as a major problem. Nonetheless, here are four suggestions. First, promote technologies that are resilient to government censorship. End-to-end -end encryption of phones and messaging is a good start, right? We ought to be building it into all of our systems and we ought to be using systems only if they are in fact encrypted. Blockchain-based technologies can allow persistent pseudonymity so that you can actually interact with a person, know that you are interacting with them without having to kind of identify them and know who they are. Uh, VPNs, virtual private networks, can allow tunneling through national firewalls to give you access to other people's internet experiences. I think we need to fight back doors wherever we can, right? not just when China imposes them, but when the US tries to impose them on Apple phones as well. So right now, many of these technologies are fringe. Right? If you use blockchain, there's probably something wrong with you. Right? Maybe, you're, you know, maybe you're a drug dealer or you're you know, engaged in sort of uh, uh, high level copyright piracy or something. Uh, we often associate these fringe technologies with, with criminals. Um, but that was once true of standard SSL encryption. And the US tried to block standard encryption uh, from internet chips back in 1995. Now it's standard. Right? Now you wouldn't want to go give your credit card uh, number to somebody, much less bank with them, if they didn't actually have a secure transaction with a standard encryption uh, that was once considered a da dangerous fringe technology that was going to allow criminals to get away with all sorts of stuff. Widespread adoption of these technologies of connection, I think, makes balkanization harder. Uh, and at a minimum, uh, we shouldn't be making them illegal, either directly uh, or through regulation via indirect devices like copyright anti-circumvention. Right? Like saying that, hey, you're facilitating a bad act by being anonymous, by being encrypted, and so we need to stop you. Second, uh, I think we ought to resist as individuals hyper-personalization 
uh, we ought to resist device and software specialization by private companies, just as we ought to resist it by countries. Google, Tencent, Apple, and others want to keep you in their ecosystem, right? They want to send you uh, from their search engine to their pet uh, uh, systems uh, for, because the longer they can keep you in the ecosystem, the more information they can learn about you, the more opportunities they have to sell you things. Um, venture outside. Don't use software only from your country. Don't use software all from the same company. Uh, that's already, I think, a push away from uh, the walled gardens at the private level. Third, at a legal level, I think we ought to promote open APIs, applications, program interfaces, both as a business and a legal matter. Companies want to create those walled gardens. They want to regulate who can see in over the wall, who can get access to that information. The law has not traditionally let them, but a number of legal tools, including the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and copyright law, have been used increasingly to try to prevent interoperability, to prevent me from making a software program that actually allows Facebook users to share their uh, data across Facebook and other platforms, right? Uh, and that might allow the building of an alternative to Facebook. Now, there are Arguably good reasons why you want to prevent some of the sharing. Uh, it's sometimes justified on privacy grounds, although I have to say that the idea that Facebook is out there protecting your privacy uh, by preventing you from using a cross-platform app, which was the argument they made successfully in power integrations versus Facebook, is a bit far-fetched to me. Um, but lack of open interfaces means concentration of private economic power. It means we all end up in the, in the same uh, system, and that in turn means a central choke point governments can target. And that leads me to the final point, uh, which is we ought to be looking for mechanisms to promote vibrant competition in internet platforms. Uh, we have stifled the sort of Schumpeterian competition that has driven the tech industry for the last several years in which kind of one company comes up out of nowhere and displaces the dominant market company. Uh, that hasn't happened for a long time, right? If you look at the dominant companies, Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, uh, Netflix, uh, they're old. Right? There were, none of them are less than 15 years old. Uh, most of them are more than 20 years old. Uh, that's a long time in the tech industry to be dominant. Uh, I have a whole separate paper on why that might be the case, a uh, paper called Exit Strategy, which talks about how we've built the tech industry funding mechanisms in such a way that encourage people uh, not to build their company into the new Google killer, uh, but to sell out and to sell out to the incumbent, to Google itself. Um, but for whatever mechanism, I think we need competition in platforms, right? Because if you lose choice, it becomes much easier to think of your internet provider as your regulator, becomes much easier for governments to regulate them. So I think we need more robust antitrust law. We also need to rethink the way we fund startups and rethink the way we sort of drive technology uh, not to consolidate, not to sell out to the big company, uh, but to drive the company that will, uh, uh, will replace that big company. So I think these are good ideas. I'm, I also don't think any of them are going to get us Barlow's free and independent internet. It probably never existed. But the internet took off in the 1990s as an alternative to the official government corporate information superhighway, right? The idea of 500 channels of TV as a push medium. We got the 500 channels, but we got a lot more. I think we should fight hard not to give it up for an information superhighway, particularly one that's controlled by our national governments. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? This is regarding blockchain and specifically Ethereum. So, one of the theories is that you can um, have like smart contracts. So what, like people like George Church, there's about 10 companies that are involved with using this for electronic health records and genomes and data. And this will deal with a lot of the problems, the cyber, the income inequality, and privacy, but not job displacement. So if you have um, smart contract and micro payments, the more I learn about Ethereum and blockchain, the more confused I get. <laughs> and Jamie Dimon, the way now he has like a $5 million smart network dedicated just to that. 
I, so I, I, you are not alone in being more confused the more you learn about blockchain. I, so, and I, I confess that my uh, knowledge of blockchain is an amateur's knowledge of blockchain. Um, I, so it seems to me there are kind of a couple of pieces to it, right? Uh, one which captured everybody's attention is the money bit, right? Bitcoin uh, and all of the other money pieces. Uh, but, that, but that was always the tail wagging the dog, right? So blockchain, as I understand it, the concept is, right, we can uh, have a secure ledger uh, that tells us whether or not you are, in fact, the owner of this property or whether or not this is actually an accurate uh, uh, form of your medical records without having a single, single canonical source, which is one of the things I say we don't want. Uh, right? If, if we create a network and a set of incentives for people to basically uh, uh, approve or uh, agree on any changes to that ledger. But they've got to have an incentive to do that, and so we created this, this concept, Bitcoin, basically to give people an incentive to spend their time and money uh, verifying their ledger. Uh, and then the coins kind of took off and became their own market uh, in ways that might or might not be sort of helpful to the overall project. My sense is that uh, there are transactions for which a blockchain makes sense, and there are transactions for which a blockchain does not make sense. Uh, it is computationally expensive, it's energy expensive, and it's time consuming uh, to identify and verify any change in a ledger transaction. So I don't think you want it for stock exchanges, for instance, right? for anything where there's a high velocity of uh, information moving back and forth. Uh, but it might be useful for things that we don't want to change at all, right? like uh, our DNA sequence, uh, or uh, things we want to change only very infrequently, like uh, the title deed to our house or our car. Uh, and so there you might have the ability to say, here's a way to kind of actually verify and guarantee information. And one of the benefits of that way is that it does not have to be uh, in the hands of a central register, which is either a government entity or is subject to uh, seizure or control by a government entity. Um, uh, and it might, uh, it might be private. It might be something that I can sort of put in a, in a circumstance, put in a, uh, in a blockchain in a way that allows me to guarantee that no one's played with my DNA sequence information, that it's still, uh, it's still accurate and intact, but without sharing to anyone whose uh, DNA sequence information it is. So I think there are problems it solves. I agree with you that it doesn't solve every problem. Um, and I worry a little bit, honestly, about the energy costs, right? I mean, the way we, the way we paid for it turns out to be really clever but also maybe not cheap as we scale up blockchain to, to lots and lots of different things. Tunnel through some of these systems as one possible solution. And I'm wondering if the current kind of default of like the onion router network and Tor and all that, is that, is that threatened by these hardware changes or how do you think that might need to change to become this sort of backup? Yeah. Internet? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know enough about the technology of sort of what the next generation sort of, you know, what a Chinese or, or, or even the US 5G internet looks like to, uh, to know kind of how much of a threat there is. But I, but I think there is a risk there, right? I think um, the countries that would like to sort of have a national internet, right, would like to then shut down at least sufficiently uh, large or sufficiently prominent ways around that uh, firewall. Uh, and so they'd like to shut down Tor. Um, I, I, so I don't know whether or not sort of there's a feasible way to build a restriction into Tor into the, into the next generation of the Chinese uh, uh, architecture, for instance. Um, but I'm sure they're going to try. Uh, now. You know, the good news about encryption historically is, right, is that it's been asymmetrically hard, uh, right? It's easier to, uh, to make your encryption better than it is to tackle your encryption on the, uh, on the back end. Um, ask me in 10 years whether we have quantum computing uh, and whether that changes, right? But so far, at least, that's held up pretty well for 25 years, so that's a somewhat encouraging sign that uh, you might need better and better VPNs, but that they should, that so far, they've had to have been able to outrun the, the alternative. Jamie, were you on this? Uh, you said solutions. <clears throat> I was thinking about the, the um, paradox or difficulty that um, Google faced in persuading people to adopt an operating system for non-Apple phones. 
And one of the brilliant things they did is to say, we're going to make this open source, so we are binding ourselves mm -hmm. that you'll be able to use it and change it and do what you want with it. It's a pre-commitment mechanism. We can't suddenly say, once you've built your phones around our system, oh, by the way, we changed our mind. And we have <coughs> are there equivalent things, equivalent product features almost, that the United States or Western countries or liberal democracies could build into an open set of networked standards such that they would make them attractive because everyone's going to need some set of standards, right? And, but as I was listening to your talk, all of the things that you think are features, end-to-end um, -end difficulty of control, etc., would seem like bugs to many governments. If you flipped it around and said, to what extent could these also be seen as features? Is there any? Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, and actually open source is, to me, a great example, right? Uh, because, because that actually is an attractive feature for a lot of uh, countries, uh, in part for financial reasons, in part for, for historical reasons, right? So that this is, a lot of countries will look at this and say, well, this is a way out of kind of dominance by the US uh, uh, software paradigm. Uh, it's cheaper for our government to get open source software than to go buy it. Um, uh, people can sort of work on it here. It's, I think open source, open source is complicated in various ways, right? So it might depend a little bit on what open source license you use. Um, uh, one risk is the forking risk. Um, and the governments might well say, yes, we're going to adopt this uh, lovely open source platform, and then we're going to sort of fork it and, and, uh, in a way that uh, gives us surveillance control. Now, the fact that they are at least legally obligated to release that code out to the rest of the world helps, right? Because it might make it easier to get around. It might be easier to know what it uh, uh, what it is. So, I think open source is actually a. I, I'm going to I'm going to take that as a kind of uh, a useful suggestion on the on the list. There are other things that are at least uh, signals. Uh, so, one of my favorite examples is the warrant canary. Um, uh, so under the FISA Act, the U.S. government gets to come and ask for uh, national security uh, uh, wiretaps and surveillance, and you are not allowed to tell anyone that the government has asked you, uh, even after the fact. Um, so somebody came up with the idea of a warrant canary in which every month they say, hey, guess what? This month we were not uh, asked by the government uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, give over your private information. And then if they're asked, well, they just don't say anything. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. Right? So there may, be, there may be things like that that sort of like build in, you, that you could build techno into technology right? that at least sort of signals or identifies the existence of surveillance, identifies that data is being altered, that it's being snooped. Uh, right? That doesn't make the problem go away, but it may be highlighting the problem helps. I'm, I'm somewhat less confident of that after Snowden than I was before, because I actually thought that that would change more than it did. Uh, but is at least better than not knowing that you're being surveilled. You identified the problem, at least as I understand it, as a problem of representation, state government, um, democracy even, autocracy. But the solutions are mainly focused on tech, right? So the, the, the way that you identify the problem is essentially that um, state government has overcome technology and the promise of technology being able to get around government really has not worked. But then the solutions are all about tech and not about um, government and democracy and representation. Yeah. Right? So it just seems to me to be sort of like a, a mm -hmm. mismatch there, right? And I, or at least I perceive it to be. So I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, so I would love to see political solutions. Um, what, what, I, what, what troubles me is that the political solutions are going to be effective precisely in the countries that need them the least, right? Uh, that a country that actually wants to uh, sort of control its population, censor its population, is one for whom we're not going to be able to get a law passed that sort of restricts that ability. Um, and. So I mean, I, I kind of I mentioned a little bit the idea of kind of international law and international norms. And I don't mean to dismiss that entirely. I, I do think there's, there has been historically some uh, signaling value, if nothing else, right, in saying, hey, what you're doing here is a violation of a well-established international norm. 
I just worry that in the modern world, right, that we're not uh, that we're not going to see those international norms, and that if we see them, maybe they're not actually the norms that we want, right? That if you actually got the got all the countries to sit down and vote one by one in the general assembly, uh, we might actually vote for a kind of restricted lockdown national internet. Um, whether or not the people in those countries would benefit from it, because the governments would benefit. So that's not to say that we shouldn't have them, we shouldn't try for them, but I'm nervous about. The, uh, about how effective they'll be. And so one of the reasons I aim for tech solutions is because I'm interested in trying to see whether there is a way to build an internet that, in John Gilmore's words, right, treats censorship as damage and routes, routes around it effectively in a way that we did 30 years ago. Great. The last remarks uh, call to mind uh, this development in Europe. In the time of the WIPO copyright treaty, the big governments came in, all geared up to police uh, the, uh, the internet and uh, filter it. And uh, that was voted down, and we got the notice and take down the screen that has worked incredibly well. And now, as you know, the Europeans have decided to change that, and uh, we now have the filtering. And in your talk, that filtering uh, requirement acquires <laughs> Uh, a potentially ominous uh, uh, characterization that I hadn't fully uh, realized. So I think this is something we really need to think about. I, no, I think that's right. I, I think it's bad on its own terms. I think the European Copyright Directive from last year is a really bad idea as a matter of copyright law. Uh, but I also think once you establish the, uh, the principle that every uh, internet company must read through everything you do and filter for a really complex set of, of, uh, uh, of tasks, right, uh, to make sure that there's not bad stuff out there, it's pretty easy to add to the list of the bad stuff. Right? I mean, you know, sure, we, we should add, we clearly should, clearly we should add child pornography, right? Everybody agrees that's bad. Uh, we ought to add terrorist uh, and terrorist sympathizing messages. That's all bad stuff. Um, uh, and then everybody's going to have their own list of what's bad, right? And, and you, tech companies, will all have built uh, the technology for control because you had to do it in order to survive copyright law in Europe if you wanted to sell your, uh, sell your technologies in Europe. said it, I think maybe it was John Terry Barlow who said that information wants to be free. Would you say that information is freer now than it was when he spoke and freer then than it had been before? So that's an interesting question. Um, I think the answer is yes, that it is freer. What that makes me think about in turn, and again, I, I really want to come back to you with this question, is why. And I have my own thought about why, but if that's so, what makes you think so? Yeah, I, so I mean, I, I, I think it's a hard question. So one, there is, uh, right, in the open source line, right, free is in free speech versus free is in free beer, uh, right? I mean, and maybe it's freer in both senses, right? That is, it might actually be less expensive in many respects to have access to information than it used to be. Uh, but it might, but I think it also might be uh, that sort of there's more communication of information from more sources. I worry that we're reversing that trend right now, which is one of the things that concerns me. But I, but I think the internet has been a dramatic expansion. And to me, the reason is precisely because it wasn't the information superhighway. Because it was not, uh, here are the canonical providers of information, and they will give you the information, and you will passively consume it. Uh, it was because the, the providers of information are all of us. right? It's everybody who posts on YouTube. Uh, it's everybody who posts on a blog. right? We made all of us creators. That's got some bad sides, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of sort of uh, political polarization that arguably can be traced to uh, letting a bunch of people talk who were otherwise keeping quiet. Um, uh, but, it's, but I think it does give us more access to information. Um, and it gives us the tools to learn more and to try to figure out uh, more easily what's right and what's not. Whether we use those tools is a different question. Just offer one more thought, or maybe two, depending on how much time we have. Here's the next thing that occurs to me. 
It seems to me that what you've done today, and, and I think it's been a magnificent lecture, is, is lay out the ways in which the idea of, of, of a free internet has been subjected to a kind of, in some ways predictable, but nevertheless an intriguing set of resistances, not just one resistance, but actually a number of them, because they're not all the same, the character of the resistance doesn't even spring quite from the same impulse, it seems to me. Does that sound right to you? I agree with that. Now, what, what strikes me is that meanwhile, the resistance is failing. And if we look at the resistance and we ask ourselves, how baleful are the prospects posed by that resistance, the answer may very well be not as much as one might imagine if you concentrate primarily on the resistance rather than the ineffectiveness of the resistance, which seems to me to be substantial. So I, I, I hear you, right? And so it is, I, 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 so start with the original premise, right? Which is that we are better off than we were 30 years ago before the internet, right? So we've moved in the right direction. I, to me, the question is, um, are, does that mean we will continue to move in the right direction? Um, and, 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 I'm, and I am worried that we are not. I am worried that we are at an inflection point in which we are uh, increasingly going to be trying to lock down information uh, because a bunch of different entities have interests that end up coalescing in, uh, in locking down that information. I would be delighted to be wrong. Please. Years ago, Henry Maine, who was then a professor at Harvard, studied the writ system of the, of the Middle Ages. And what he said that has stuck with me ever since I first read it is that when you look at the writ system, it is clear that the substance of the law was secreted in the interstices of the writs. The writs have disappeared, but the growing evolution of the law has expanded and expanded and expanded. It seems to me that probably John Perry Barlow was not quite right when he said information wants to be free. What I suspect it would have been more accurate to say is that opinion wants to be free. But I think that the freedom of, in, of opinion, opinion freedom, and that's not necessarily a comfortable thing may actually be freer and may be very difficult to resist effectively, even though from time to time, and now is one, we may have good reason to share your pessimism about the direction in which we're going. The writ system has disappeared. I think that the, I think procedure probably is always subject to over mastering by the substance. And there, there it seems to me, is the relationship between the internet and the things that we might have hoped for in the internet offset in a particular way by something that I really will stop. Uh, by texting, I, I'm fascinated by texting, which you glanced on, but really haven't discussed directly. Texting strikes me as having the effect of really quite dramatically changing the way we actually think about each other and the way that we share opinions. Uh, I'm done. Okay, lots, lots there, and then I will be done. Um, uh, the, um, I mean, so I, I mean, the, the short version is I hope you're right, but I fear that you're wrong. Um, I, I am. I, I think procedure matters more. Um, uh, it's not that substance doesn't matter, not that it can't take over procedure, but I think, I think a lot of the reason we have the kinds of conversations and dialogues we have today is because we built a procedural mechanism that made that feasible. And if we hadn't built that procedural mechanism, you're right, it changes, texting changes the way we think, but so does the idea that I can upload uh, anything I want, that I can sort of um, uh, you know, put up a video and say, oh, well, here's, a, here's an idea that I hadn't seen before. Here's, here's my own thoughts about the world and people can watch it or not. That's a, that is a, uh, Ethel de Sola Poole talked about technologies of freedom, right? I mean, that is potentially a technology of freedom. Um, but I think it doesn't have to be a technology of freedom, right? Because the information flow can go in multiple directions. You need a government sufficiently willing to crack down on you for what you say. Uh, but th there are those governments out there, and there may be more of them than you think, 
Because crack down might not just mean put a million Uyghurs in a concentration camp and re-educate them uh, until they believe uh, China, uh, but it might mean, um, well, you know what? People who think what you think actually are more likely to default on their loans. They're more likely to uh, uh, misuse guns. And so maybe various other aspects of your life should be, inter should be affected by uh, these things that we have learned about you. Uh, so I don't, I mean, I don't think, um, I, I don't think there is, I don't think we can sort of get out from under the idea that sort of the government will have access to this information uh, and, and bad governments will make use of this information. Uh, but I think we can build the procedure, build the technology in a way that makes it harder for them to do so while still getting the benefits that we got from allowing many-to-many -many communication. Uh, and with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you.